I want to welcome everyone today to IMC High Point Market Programming for our market that's coming up. Our High Point Market is June 5th through 9th, and we invite everybody to join us on site in High Point, North Carolina. Um, today, we have a great panel discussion going to be led by uh, John Conrad with International Society of Furniture Designers. And um, the topic is shining a spotlight on product design. Uh, just a few tips. If you have any questions, please put those into the Q&A and we will get to those towards the end. If you're viewing this on Facebook, you can type those also into the chat there and I'll pose those to the panelists. Um, and if you're watching this on YouTube afterwards, um, we welcome you to email me at kporter at IM Centers and I'll get any questions that you might have over to um, John and pose them to the panelists afterwards and they'll be in contact then. This is CEU accredited. So if you need that education credit, it will be emailed out afterward for those who registered through Zoom. If you're watching through Facebook or YouTube, you can email me directly and I'll get that information to you. Um, and we just wanna welcome everyone. And thank you to everyone joining us today on the panel um, from International Market Centers and High Point Market. John, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Kim, thank you. Uh, welcome to Shining a Spotlight on Product Design. I'm John Conrad, Executive Director of International Society of Furniture Designers and your moderator for today. Let me introduce our panel of industry innovators, working designers who will offer their insights into the journey of creating enduring designs that generate consumer excitement and drive sales. They are Stephen Elton, who serves as Chief Brand Curator for Brown Jordan, the leading manufacturer of luxury outdoor furnishings. Stephen oversees the creation process for all Brown Jordan showrooms, product catalogs, photo shoots, strategic partnerships, developing exclusive Brown Jordan fabrics and special projects. He also works closely in designer collaborations with industry designer icons like Richard Frenier, Anne-Marie Varing, I think I've got that right, Stephen, and Tawan Nguyen. Uh, we also have with us, and welcome, Stephen. We also have with us Fred Spector. Fred is Associate Chair of Furniture Design at Savannah College of Art and Design, known as SCAD, and owner of award-winning Frederick Spector Design Studios, specializing in commercial and residential furniture, lighting, tabletop product designs. His current client list includes William Sonoma, Pottery Barn, Restoration Hardware, Bassett Furniture, Lane Venture, Reed and Barton, Macy's, and many other U.S. and Canadian furniture manufacturers. Welcome, Fred. Amy Kersner, Director of Furniture at Curry & Company. Amy is a trained furniture designer, a furniture maker, and creative force behind the newly revitalized furniture program at Curry & Company. Her products for Curry have won multiple Pinnacle Awards and two Arts Awards, and have been featured in LA Decor, Traditional Home, Veranda, Southern Home, Better Homes and Gardens, Gray Magazine, and Home Accents Today. Welcome, Mamie, and on to Chase Ryan. Chase is founder and principal designer of Chase Ryan Furniture and Design, who started his furniture career as a retail sales professional at Top 100 retailer Lewis Shanks Furniture in Austin, Texas, where he credits the Forwood family for helping him family launch for helping, for helping him. That was me. That was bouncing me. Back and bouncing forth. back and forth. Sorry. Sorry. Helping him launch his design helping career. Helping him launch his design career. By designing upholstery and case goods. He currently partners with and creates designs for several high quality companies making their products in the United States. So welcome everybody. Yep. Let me start out by uh, asking everyone in the panel and I'll just throw it to one of you to start with and then we'll just work around the group um, and jump in where you want as the conversation continues uh, with the first question and that is, what does good design mean to you? Uh, let me start with, let's say, Stephen. Go ahead. Thank you. So I think uh, we look at it a couple different ways. Um, 
understanding that we've been in business for 75 years. So there's three things that we, uh, we look at. We look at our, and you talked about it in the introduction, we look at our partnerships, um, make sure that, you know, we have, uh, we have close relationships that understand uh, where we want to go and what the direction is and that we're, we agree on the direction we want to go on. And then the two things that are the key is we want to set trend and we want to be innovative. One of the things that makes uh, our company, Brown Jordan, known throughout the world is being innovative, that we push the envelope as far as new materials, things that others haven't tried before. And by doing that, we're setting trend. And those are the two key components that have been in our uh, have been in our point of view in our, in our DNA since our, in our inception, being innovative and setting trend, and they're connected together. Thank you, Stephen. Amy, what are your thoughts? Um, thank you. Uh, I think for current company, it's really about being distinctive, um, which is also part of being on trend and innovative. Um, I think as designers, we're all trying to create something new. There's never going to be new geometry, but it's um, using your lens and creating something uh, that maybe somebody hasn't seen before. The other thing too for us is making sure that it can sell. Um, researching the consumers and bringing them new products that they can't find anywhere else. Thanks, Amy. Yeah. Chase, your thoughts on that? What does good design mean to you? I think for myself as a designer, everything is heavily story-based. Um, good design for me does not happen without a story that actually inspired it to start with. And so everything that I design starts with something, whether it's a culture, whether it's geography, uh, whether it's a person in particular, whether it's Ferragamo shoes, uh, whatever it is, I'll take something like that and then be inspired by those lines and just translate it into something you can live with. Thanks, Jay. Fred, your thoughts? You're, you're on mute. <laughs> I would say that good design uh, solves a problem. That problem could be, um, you know, a real physical problem in that helps you kind of in your life, or it could just be uh, a manufacturing problem or an interior design problem or um, a new material and be incorporated. But somehow, you know, it, it maybe it brings uh, a new take into a company's line that, that increases their sales, but, you know, somehow it solves a problem. Problem solving. Good, good answer. Um, the next question for the group um, will be, how does understanding the region, consumer, and retail arena you're dealing with for any particular client inform your, the development of your design of your products? So I'll repeat that again. How does understanding the region, consumer, uh, and retail arena you're dealing with for a particular client inform your development of a product design? Uh, Fred, go ahead. Since you just finished, start on. Um, and I think that's that's sort of a huge issue. I mean, we um, have clients that are sort of you know all over North America when we're you know designing things for. Canadian companies for interest, 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 Canadians are more attuned to modern design, you know, less of the tradition that, that American customers bring into. So when I know a product's going to be kind of heavily sold in Canada, try to make it fit that market. If I know uh, I have a companies that, that don't ship a whole lot of product to the West Coast. And so it's a different sort of take on design on the West Coast. So and you have to sort of understand the the market of where your products are going to be and, and who's going to buy them. And I think that definitely, you know, influences the design. Got it. Amy? Um, very similar. I, I think, you know, at Curry, we really, the majority of our customers are interior designers. So I'm always looking at what's in the marketplace and how can I bring that interior designer something very unique and different that they can bring to their clients. Now, I've done some traveling with some of our sales reps in the Northwest, uh, Pacific Northwest, and then also done like St. Louis and Chicago and here in Georgia. And it is all quite a bit different. Um, and for me, those traveling experiences and working with our sales reps is gaining insight from them 
as sales reps, but also from their customers as to what they're looking for. And then I like taking the opportunity to, um, you know, window shop while I'm at those cities so that I can see what is trending in those different places and then bring it back to the drawing table. Thank you, Stephen. So clearly at Brown Jordan, we have a pretty distinct point of view. So, you know, we're a, we're a modern company. So um, what we try and do, so we have focus groups. We have focus groups that have consumers, retailers, designers, and some major editors from some of the shelter magazines that we, we push everything out to and we ask them and they come back and give us feedback. We're clear on what the frame and the structure is going to look like because, you know, we're, we're, we clearly have, as I said, our point of view where we will change and we'll, we'll, we'll expand depending on the marketplace and to include all the marketplaces is in textiles and colors and things in that nature. So we'll, we'll take the same basic uh, body, if you will, same basic frame and then change and adjust as it relates to textiles and fabrics. And uh, like I said, we have our focus groups that help us uh, identify that if we're on the right track or not, if, if there's something that uh, they think fits into uh, to our offering. So Stephen, are those focus groups relatable to, I mean, related to, to region? Is there regionality to their input? Yes. They give you? Yeah, most of the press, uh, most of the press is coming from New York. There's, there's one out West, but no, they're, they're totally focused on, on all the different regions. Um, especially when you get into, when you start comparing um, the South and, and the, the Northeast, especially, which is where it's a huge segment of our business. Um, when it gets to textiles and fabrics, there's there's a clear, uh, you can see the clear difference start to shift as far as uh, textures, even in pricing to, to some degree, but definitely in textures and in colors. Gotcha. Thank you. Chase. That was one of the biggest wake up calls I had when I got into actual product design was just um, regional sales. I, I knew the Texas market extremely well. Uh, I sold it for almost 10 years uh, in Austin and everything down here is Texas size. So if I did a sofa that was a hundred inches and then it went there, it went somewhere on the East coast. And, you know, they said, well, we need something that's, you know, 72 or something. It was uh, kind of a wake up call that not everything is as big as it is in Texas. So I had to start digging into some of that and learning more about regional design and just styles and colors even uh, that go to Florida or California or New York. Uh, and then a lot of that just happened, like Amy said, was just going with reps and visiting the cities and looking at the stores and seeing what was there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to this thread shortly because I'm gonna pull it pull it back in when we when we talk about uh, uh, design directions and so forth. But uh, uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna toot my own horn a minute. Uh, for the past 25 years, ISFD. Uh, has adhered to several criteria for judging the Pinnacle Awards, this being our 25th year of uh, giving out Pinnacle Awards uh, for the best in furniture design in 24 different categories, this year including, for the first time ever, textiles. Uh, but one in particular uh, <clears throat> criteria, and I think Amy mentioned this a little earlier, is that the product sells. So what are some of the challenges that present, present themselves to you as a designer? Uh, give us your insights into the journey of creating an enduring design when you also have to drive the consumer excitement and most of all drive sales for either your own company or a, a client of yours. So I'll, I'll start with, uh, with Ryan when, we, when we're talking about it's got to sell <laughs> if it's a good design. Go ahead, Ryan. You're up, Brian. Did you hear me on that, Ryan? Oh. I think you're on mute. Yeah. So what's your interpretation of that, that criteria? When you're thinking about working with your clients or product on your own, um, obviously the, the product's got to sell, but that's really in the direction in your, your goal, right? Yeah, I think that's one of the main reasons why I prefer story-based product design because it's something that can immerse the consumer so much more than just seeing, you know, sticks or rags in a window. Uh, they can get something and go far beyond just the product design, but the history of it and get to engage in that. And so I, 
but I mean, as far as just the sales aspect of it goes, I mean, that's one of the benefits that I believe that I have from retail for so long because I sold, you know, the top 200 manufacturers in this industry and I did it day in and day out on Saturday and Sunday and I know what would sell and what wouldn't. I um, mean, the, the scales and colors things in that market. And so for me, it was just more understanding the other markets to get nationwide sales as opposed to just Central Texas. Gotcha. 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 Steven, in, uh, in a big company, you ship all over the place. Uh, what, uh, where do you go when you, do you consider that in your initial, you know, framing of what you're going to look for in, in a new product? Yeah, I think people would think we don't because you know we're considered high end. But we, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna agree with Chase a little bit. We, so we painstakingly put a lot of time. We have different focus groups. We had, we like to gut check everything. So we have different focus groups, mostly based on retail and some design, um, and then even some consumer uh, as it relates to price. So we we have parameters. Uh, we ask our reps. I mean, we 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 spend months before we launch a product as it relates to pricing, and I know that intimately because it's uh, something I have a responsibility for with Crown Jordan. So we spend a lot of time, and then we'll go out and we'll test market it um, with some of our direct reps early on to make sure that we're right about that. We do a lot of uh, competitive analysis. So if we have a collection that we're going to launch, we'll go and we'll look at people that we think may have something that's similar, we'll get that information, we'll put it in, we'll put it in the blender, we'll sort of look at it. So I would probably think that most would think that Brown Jordan doesn't spend as much time on it as we do. But if you launch a collection, you make a mistake, not only with design, but you make a mistake as it relates to price, it's very rare you get a chance to come back and fix it. So we spend, um, we spend an inordinate amount of time gut checking that and making sure that, it, that we think it's, uh, it's going to be a sellable product on all channels of distribution that we have um, before we launch it. Thanks, David. Amy, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I want to preface first that as designers, sometimes you don't even know what's going to be a bestseller. Um, you might have an inclination and you believe in your product and you believe it's beautiful, but you just, sometimes you just don't know what's really going to take off. And sometimes there's products that you design that you didn't, it, maybe it's not your favorite one and you didn't think it was going to take off. And all of a sudden it's the best selling product at the company. Uh, at Curring Company, we take a lot of time looking at trends um, and then we kind of digest that and dive deep and we are designing on our own, but also within the realms of those style stories that we have for, it's kind of yearly and then it transcends into like a year and a half, two years. Um, but it is, it's, it's researching the market, seeing what's out there, also looking at price points because sometimes uh, you can design a product that perceived value is going to, it's like, it has to make sure that it matches the perceived value of the product. So there's products out there that you see as your competitors. So you're like, all right, well this, then we can sell it at this price point as well, because there's products being sold at that same price point in the marketplace. Um, but it's extremely important. I think at Curring Company, we're uh, fortunate that we can take some risks and introduce some products that really have a wow factor mm -hmm. and that we are okay, um, maybe not selling 100, 500 of them, but we're, we have that ability to make 10 of them. Mm -hmm. And if it's super expensive and it just brings our showrooms and the consumers in for the wow factor, we're able to do that. So that's pretty amazing that we can do that. Fred, you've worked, thank you, Amy. You, Fred, you've worked with a, a number of, of different kinds of clients all over the spectrum. I mean, uh, you, you kind of have to wear a lot of hats knowing a little bit of each market area, marketplace, uh, where they where they stand within, you know, against their competitors price point wise, and obviously, you're doing tabletop, you're doing lighting, you're 
how do you uh, how do you juggle all that? Well, I mean, it, you, you try you try and you know you try and do your best to understand um, uh, trends and colors and finishes. And I mean, um, having having spent some time with Steve Elton, like he's he's a he's a genius when it comes to colors and and trends and. Um, but you know, you just try and do your best. I mean, I, I you know, the, the, with with the, the furniture market, you know, having a, a market now like four times a year, in it's a fast paced thing, and, and we sometimes you just don't always have the benefit of of doing all the research and and the uh, and the, the things you would like to do to bring a product to market. And I always feel like when when a product becomes like really really successful, it's like the stars aligned, right? You got the right finish with the right form with the right price with the right, you know, hardware. I mean, it's just, there's so many things that can fall apart at any point in the design process. Um, I think furniture is a lot harder sometimes than, than tabletop products because tabletop products are more form, you know, designing flatware, you know, we, you know, it, we know it's gonna be stainless steel for designing glassware and glass, but in designing furniture, there's, you know, there's gotta have the right form and you gotta put the right finish on it. It's gotta be the right sheen and it's gotta have the right hardware to dress it up. and and, and you know, it's got to come at the right price. And, and then all that has to be with a company that's right for that, you know? So at any point in that process, it can all fall apart. And, and you know, when, when like I said, when, when you have a product that sells well, it's kind of like the stars align and um, every, all, all those pieces came together. And who's somebody who works on a royalty base contract, like all of that is really important. <laughs> uh, a quick question related to that, because everybody has mentioned it in their answer. Um, obviously I'm not talking about during COVID time, but I will in a minute. Uh, let's just talk about pre-COVID or you, have you noticed in the last, let's say in the last five years prior to, to COVID shutdown, the speed to market, the speed of speed to market, maybe even doubling as far as how fast you've got to get things done and get a move through the process to get out the other end. Uh, anybody can jump in on that one. Anybody got a thought, Stephen? What has speed to market increased? No. Okay. Um, it's changed how to go to market. So uh, obviously, we didn't even know what Zoom was a year ago, and now <laughs> we're, you know, we're not even, um, you know, we we haven't been at a market in quite some time now. So, and we've been able to uh, use. The marketing team and we've been able to use a lot of assets that the marketing team has developed our our on the road team and uh and zoom and you know ring central and all those types of things to change how how we do it but we've not we're pretty um you know when we launch a collection it's it's a it's a big deal and we launch quite a few collections yes but it's got to be you know, there's an expectation of Brown Jordan. So it's gotta be right. You know, we're working with some of the world's top known designers who are meticulous about what they want. And um, we, we, we've not sped it up. We've just changed how we do it and we've gotten smarter at it. And so I think we can, we'll be able to do more over a course of time. But for us, it's more about, um, you know, the DNA at Brown Jordan is about design. And it's, and so, you don't get a sec, like I said before, you don't get a second chance. So we want to make sure it's right before we launch it. Thank you, Steve. So for the rest of you, I'm thinking, okay, speed to market, obviously everything went to a grinding halt uh, back in March of last year. But here's another thought also, did this taking a breath moment that we had cause us to do what, what Steve just mentioned that we basically, that we, uh, as Steven said, we, we, uh, took a breath, we analyzed how we're doing things. And in a sense, we're coming out of COVID in the selling marketing of, of product design and products going forward in a, in a, how do I want to say this? In a way that's a combination of virtual and, and in-person going forward that we would have never had if we weren't forced to do the virtual learning experience or learn about yeah. how to do it. Yeah. 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 Amy, you're, you're nodding. What? Same thing um, for you all? I mean, we're all adapting and adjusting, and our partners overseas are trying to do the same. Um, 
I think, you know, if we're talking about processes now versus what they were before, of course, we're late night meetings, early morning meetings with overseas, um, the more the better, uh, just to make sure things are progressing at a good speed. Um, and then also just, I mean, when I used to travel, there was always a moment when if I, there's one factory where the products were always on the factory floor mm -hmm. and it's not the best lighting. So we would literally take, I was like, we need to bring it outside. Let's go. <laughs> we take it on the dolly, get it outside to make sure the colors are every and everything is right. And now they know that I like that. And so we've been doing some Zoom meetings where they take the products outside for me and or they purposely take photos outside and inside for me so I can make sure that some colors and things are working and or that process is different where we're approving finishes and materials before that sample is made versus me getting over there, it's still in Whitewood and I'm selecting the finish and we're working the finish while I'm there. So just out of curiosity, do you have anybody standing next to the piece when you're looking at it? Just, you know, just in case you're worried about scale and proportion. Oh yeah. Yeah. My constant email back is like, please have somebody sitting in the chair, front view, side view angle, and then standing next to something, open the door for me. Has anybody else had that experience where there's maybe been a slight uh, bit of misunderstanding and scale and proportion when you started out with your drawing and then what came out in the first sample? Uh, Fred, any thoughts on that? I'm sure you've had. I mean, yeah, it ha actually has, has a, it's been a while, but without a doubt, you know, um, something's too small usually or, uh, you know, occasionally a chair is too, you know, too, too wide or too deep. I mean, it, it's, look, I mean, it, it's, a, there's a, it's a process, right? And yeah. rarely do you get it right the first time, especially with, with seeding products. Yeah, yeah, I totally understand yeah. that. Speaking of seeding, let me throw this to Chase. You know, that's, that's been your bailiwick and, uh, you know, scale proportion, you know, seeding, as we all know, is probably the toughest thing to, to do because it's three-dimensional out in space and uh, it's a tough, tough nut to crack as a, as a designer, but, in, in the COVID period, did you find yourself uh, learning new ways of getting your point across? I found my te myself testing the furniture a lot uh, <laughs> for extensive periods of time, sitting and stuff, and uh, just going over it. But I mean, we're, we're a little different in that with this startup I'm doing now, everything's in-house, so we don't outsource anything. Mm -hmm. So if we need to go to market, you know, we don't. If we needed to go to market in seven days, we could with something that was a concept. Um, because I physically go build it myself uh, out of whatever the material is and then put it together and then refine it with the help of uh, some incredible people on our team just to make sure I don't go make it look like yippee yo okay on everything I do. And But, I mean, as far as the racks go, I mean, when, we'd, when we do scale, it's all, we kind of, I have one of my mentors taught me, you know, just find geometry that works for you. Uh, and particularly in accent chairs, and then that's your geometry. Don't change. You don't need to reinvent geometry every time you um, create a form. And so once I fell into, a, you know, a, a seat height and pitch that I liked and back height and seat depth uh, that just kind of worked, you know, that's where I've been on all my frames. You know, you just change the arm, the back, the accents of it, but the scale itself and the geometry doesn't change. Gotcha. No, that makes sense. Gosh, I wish I still had the, was back in the day when we could go out the back door and talk to the guy making the sample, or in your case, talk to yourself. Uh, the, uh, I do that quite uh, a bit. Those were wonderful times where you could actually, you know, not have to get on a plane for 12 or 15 or 20 hours, depending on your destination, to then be able to speak about the product. Uh, that, that kind of refers back to what Amy was talking about. S Stephen, any, any thoughts on <clears throat> this uh, new parameter of having in product development where you're, you're not in, in presenting the story and the marketing of the product when you're going to be doing it more than one way, virtually yeah. as well as in person. Yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty in aligned with what Amy said. So um, 
it's interesting. Like you would think that my backyard just has all these beautiful. My wife is constantly commenting. I have some of the most beautiful chairs that are samples, but none of them really match because they send them to me and, you know, and then I, you know, we live with them and look at them. And so like, it's a hodgepodge of beautiful furniture. So it's, it's actually pretty funny because now, you know, you know, we're in, we're in Texas or California, you know, for a year, we couldn't really go there. So there's a lot of, um, the engineers have become our models. So we've got one that's six foot six, we've got one that's five foot eight. So they become, you know, we get them sitting in the chair. And I, again, I agree completely with what, what Amy was talking about. We get all the different sizes and the body shapes and um, things in that nature. Again, a lot of uh, a lot of Zoom and we'll do it this way, do it that way and move it this way. So it's really forced um, companies to really think differently and learn. There's going to be things that as we come out that are going to change forever, that the way mm -hmm. we're going to look Things and you may be necessarily don't have to get on a plane to go do this where in the past you, you did. Um, and so I just think that, you know, you know, especially the better companies that, that you know, they're going to learn how to pivot. They're going to learn how to adjust and they're going to learn, learn how to sort of do it a different way. And we think about it very similar to what everybody else said. And we use, um, we use every ounce of resource we can find as we're having these conversations. We have way more NPD calls than we used to in the past because it's, you know, we want to make sure that, because you're not getting to sit around the water cooler and have those kind of like going in the backyard, like you talked about, you're not getting to have those anymore. So you just have to have more um, long distance collaboration, if you will. Gotcha. Any other thoughts on that subject? Cause I'm going to move to the next subject. This is just a general question and shoot me down for asking it, but you know, it was one of the things we put in our little pre-promo for this, this webinar. Uh, so is it form or function that motivates and inspires your design thinking? And if it's more than that, elaborate. Uh, Amy? Uh, it's Sorry, definitely someone. always both. Always right. both. Um, I don't, I mean, if it's not both, I don't know what you're doing. Uh, <laughs> you gotta make it, it, it has to work functionally, right? Um, there's a lot of ergonomics that go into all furniture. Um, there's a reason that tables are 30 inches high and they range right in there. Um, but then in terms of, you know, form, it's, you want to create beautiful products, products that people are drawn to and that they want to buy. Um, and I don't know, it's also that feeling, right? So products do bring us emotions and feelings and there's people that love their sofa or love this one chair. Um, so it's just, it's all important. <laughs> and especially the details, right? Cause that's really what makes it so special. Um, whether it's a joint detail or a hardware detail, those are the things that really elevate products above others. I heard you say earlier, probably maybe you can throw into that mix, the wow factor. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That maybe that, that would be one of the more noteworthy uh, factors in your product design, I would imagine. Yes, definitely. Right. Fred, your thoughts on that? Um, so uh, of course it's both, especially when you're dealing with, with um, seating products, but people will suffer through function if they love the form like i i look all the time on um you know in magazines and on tv like how many um eames aluminum group um office chairs there are in the world and how many new ones there are and i have to say i have one in my office at, in my, as well but it's a very uncomfortable chair people love it People love it because, I mean, there are so many better cast chairs on the market now than that chair, but people love it because it's form, right? So, of course, the best, the best products are both form and function, both comfortable and beautiful, but people will suffer through things if the form's just right. So what you're telling me is there's some great selling seating out there that is a chiropractor's best friend. There's a, there's a lot of classic modern stuff that that yeah. people still buy that's not very comfortable, but um, but they love it, you know. But and and I think that's the case with a lot of things. But you know, mm -hmm. the pieces obviously are um are are form meets function and, and 
whatever. But comfort, comfort is also, it, it varies, right? We could always test that product to fit somebody over six foot and then fit somebody like me that's right over five feet. But at the same time, there's always going to be those pieces that are more comfortable for somebody taller and for somebody shorter. Um, so it's also, you know, when it t comes to function, it, it also depends on that person. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Chase, thoughts on that? I think if you look historically just at furniture from Adrian Pearsall or Vladimir Kagan or Sam Malou for any of those guys um, that you know, have iconic forms. The only reason they became iconic is because the function and the comfort was there as well. I mean, you, you have people like Wendell Castle that did, you know, very unique art forms that are in museums and stuff, but this stuff is, you know, you look at it, you don't sit on it. Um, so it, it kind of flirts that line. And in our industry where we're here to sell stuff, we can have, it, it's great to have it pretty, but if it there is no function behind it, then it's not going to sell. Um, and that's what ultimately we're here to do, whether it's, you know, sell it 10,000 units of something a year or a hundred units of something, we still need to sell it. Um, so that's kind of been the way that we strive. We, we're not going to be remembered for our function. We're going to be remembered for our form, but we need our function to be there in order to be remembered. Hmm. Agreed. Agreed. Um, Stephen, before you mentioned your, your focus groups, and uh, let me let me bring up a little something. You know, after experiencing uh, our stay-at-home pandemic time, uh, it seems like open-plan homes uh, are much less popular than. Uh, and there's a push in home building. Of course, we're already way behind in home building anyway. Uh, to change that going forward into something less than fully open-plan, uh, how do you see a tr that trend informing furniture design? I mean we're seeing obviously when people had to do homework next to other people who were trying to do their job, uh, no matter what age either person was, it got a little loud and it got a little, you know, go in the other room and do your homework there or whatever. Is that in, informing some of the trends we're probably going to see in the next year or two? Uh, people have kind of gotten a little bit fed up with such an open plan that they, they're hearing every sound in the house while they're sitting there trying to talk to somebody on Zoom or whatever? So for us, it's a little bit different because obviously clearly, you know, we're, we're at least for the past 75 years, we've been more outside furniture, more. But we are trying to buck that trend and because we think our, our designs are so beautiful and we think that we're, you know, ahead of the curve as it relates to textiles. We've got great partners like Perennials, um, that, you know, those, you combine names like that together, it just, it, it just becomes magical. So we, we what we look to do now um, is to really take, take our uh, designs and sort of buck the trend a little bit and what would be considered outside furniture and push it more inside it to be used more, more in the home, if you would. Um, and it seems to be working pretty well for us based on some of the new collections. So we've launched um, three collections during the pandemic and um, one was ready. So, and then two we've done during, you know, and one we did with a designer in Italy. So that was particularly challenging also because it's, you know, first of all, it's, it's, it's done unbelievably well. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful collection, but that was challenging because it had innovative materials it was the supply chain issues, getting the materials, and then um, you know trying to figure out um, you know how to how to communicate that and get that launched. I was uh, pretty proud of our organization to be able to do that during during this difficult time. But when we did that collection, the concept was that it could be, although it could be outside, be absolutely fine, just like people would expect from Brown Jordan. That based on some textiles and some colors and things of that nature we would be able to, to move it. And I think this answers your question, the, the base of the question, we'd be able to move it um, more indoors also and, and have applications where the styles and designs would work that way also. Just when you thought you were done, I'm gonna add a second part to that question. That's fine. <laughs> and that is, um, you see a push uh, towards consumers wanting to experience, and this is coming out of COVID, meaning 
I'm free, you know, I'm, I'm double vaccinated, whatever. Uh, experience more fun, fashion forward, colorful, slightly extravagant looks going forward. Do you see that as a as a trend coming out of our of our you know, being in a cave? Yes. Yes. You, we, so um, you know, I'm fortunate enough to, uh, and thank you, Fred, for your kind comment. But I'm fortunate enough to be responsible for you know, the fabric and the, and the trends and things in that nature it relates, it relates to our brand. Um, I can't stress enough that our, our partnerships, like I said, like with perennials and those are key because we really collaborate. Um, we really work together. Um, they get, we have, we have a very similar point of view. And so um, as a matter of fact, we're getting ready any day now to push the button on what the fabrics and, and all of those types of things um, are going to be moving forward. So when it comes to those, to what you said is absolutely right. In the past, you know, the trend right now is a lot of uh, organic neutrals and things in that nature. And in the past, you know, we'll, you know, you try here and you try there. We're going to, we're going to have our own point of view about this. Um, but we're going to have more color because of just what you said. We, we feel that as people start to come out, you know, they're going to want to, um, that we see the pendulum, or at least we're going to force it on our end, uh, switch a little bit as far as, it, we're, again, we'll have our own point of view on it, is what that color is and, and how we want that color to look, but uh, we will definitely have uh, a little bit of switch as it relates to color, whether it becomes frame or whether it becomes the fabric. So uh, that's a great question. Okay, got it. Amy, same thing for you. Uh do you want me to repeat the question or can you remember? Yeah, please. <laughs> All right. Well, the first part is, you know, coming out of the pandemic and probably open plan might not be the yeah. most favored thing by parents, certainly going forward. And maybe that's going to affect furniture designs. But part two of that is uh, push towards consumers now getting a little more freedom in their lives mm -hmm. and breathing a little easier, wanting to experience uh, more fun, fashion forward color, slightly extravagant, uh, a little craziness in, in their home lifestyles. You mentioned it earlier about may maybe bringing the wow factor out because mm -hmm. they, need they need a wow in their lives. Is that what you're I saying? Think, trend? I think it's a little bit of both. I think there's that, I mean, not to say extremes, but you're having these people that want to be out. They want something new and fresh and wild. But I do think you're also having a, a moment where people are decluttering and then they're redoing their spaces and they want something, they're home all the time or they have been and they're realizing what they really need and what they don't need. And so they're paring things down. And I think that they're looking at things that are more, uh, that they're going to hold on to for a longer period of time, investing in those pieces that they really, really want. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that there's a little bit of the minimalism that's coming with this too, because people are paring down and they're organizing and they're getting rid of a few things because they realize that they have too much. Um, but you're right, people are looking to uh, express themselves in new ways because they've been cooped up for so long. Mm. Uh, so we're seeing a little bit of both. I think to, you know, you're realizing, hey, I could use a, a, an accent chair in that corner so I could go take some calls versus being upstairs or downstairs or what have you. So I think you're everyone's seen their spaces in a different way and what what they can and cannot place there. Fred. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think the open floor plan is here to stay. I think yeah. well, people like being together as opposed to being apart. So I think, um, you know, we, we maybe maybe if you, if, if you can afford it, if you have the space, uh, an extra bedroom might become an office. But other than that, people are going to put their office out in, in an open plan. And we're actually at SCAD, we're, we're actually, I'm running a class, we're designing um, a whole home office collection for a pretty big furniture company. And I can't really tell who it is because it's kind of proprietary. But, um, you know, we're thinking about this will be out and mostly out in open space. Um, so I think that's here to stay. As far as colors, I think it's comfort colors. Whatever, whatever that might be, you know, whether that's a warmer palette or 
I'm going to leave colors up to Steve. He will be so much better at it than me. But um, comfort colors, I think we, we seem, I seem to be hearing a lot about things, co colors that make you feel comfortable. And I think mm -hmm. we're coming out of this tumultuous time and thing, people want things that make them feel comfortable. Gotcha. Uh, Chase, good, good, good lead in from Fred on the, on the color thing. And what about textures too, when we're talking about upholstery, what do you, what do you see coming down the pike here? Well, especially what we're doing with the case goods end of things now uh, and textures in general, I mean, we're heavily leather based and, and even in our case goods now, I mean, what we're doing. So I, I definitely agree that people want a tactile hand to it and want to be able to interact with it more so than just a synthetic finish, like a heavily polyurethane based finish where you feel the plastic, not the grain uh, and just the warmth that you get from that. But I mean, we're, it's Texas here, you know, it's not uncommon to find, you know, a 10,000 square foot house. So, I mean, open is just how it happens here. You interact with furniture from all four sides. So all four sides have to be attractive. Um, especially in uh, in upholstery, I mean, the outbacks of sofas and chairs and things is huge uh, for me because that's typically when you walk in the front door of a project, that's what you see. Your first impression is the back of two chairs or the back of a sofa, um, which a lot of manufacturers, especially East Coast manufacturers, don't pay attention to at all. Um, so that was my early kind of lead in with rags in general was just making sure that the backs were paid attention to for once uh, because of this open plan. Uh, but I mean, as far as colors go and, and what we're doing now with cases, um, everything's very organic. You know, we have a lot of natural woods showing with just clear coat on them. Uh, and even in that sense, just in oiled clear coat. So it's as pure as possible, almost more of the minimalist trend that uh, Amy was talking about. So, I mean, that's very high in what we're doing and you know if people want color great uh, we have the capability to do it but for us and our with this particular startup it's just not anywhere we're chasing right now <laughs> thank you chase Thanks. Um, speaking to, to amy's comment earlier um about decluttering um and this goes to all of you and i'll raise your hand or whatever, start talking, and you'll be the lead speaker. But do you see consumers and, and, and or your clients uh, or your companies uh, appreciating uh, better details and craftsmanship and joinery of the furniture you're making um, more now than they had before or in the past, uh, meaning placing more value on the quality and less towards the cheap throwaway, you know, stick it in the house, we can always throw it out later kind of mentality. Are we, are we heading towards a place that's maybe a little bit more placing value on quality? I think there's definitely a, a reaction to um, uh, the lack of um, sort of made in America, handmade, um, uh, yeah, everything being sort of coming in is knocked down. And I mean, I, I think there's a reaction to that. I think people do want better. People do, you know, so I think the, all these Amish manufacturers were, were sort of on the fringe ones are now, you know, a big part of the equation. And so I think people are looking at things that are better quality of woods, quality of joinery, quality of finish. Um, you know, it's always comes down to price, like what people can afford. So. Amy, do you want to expand on that at all? Um. It, I, it's all of it. Like the price is going to be pretty important for most people. Um, but I do feel like more and more people are investing. Um, I think also because trends of mixing and matching where you can have an antique piece and then a modern piece allows the consumer or designer to invest in an heirloom piece, if you will. I feel like no one calls furniture heirloom pieces anymore. And I would love for that to really come back because if we're talking about form and function and beauty of products, there's products that, you know, you might want to be able to pass down or it's that inspiring piece to your grandchildren that they love that piece and maybe it spurs them to become a furniture designer or an interior designer. So. I'm, I'm hopeful that that is the case. And I think that 
with the millennials and the next generations, they, they are more concerned about where their products are coming from uh, and how it was made. And um, I, 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 think it's, I think it's there. Mm -hmm. I was thinking about that. Uh, that was the next move we were going to make in our, our conversation, Stephen. You, you know, Brown Jordan has absolutely classic designs. They have some in the past that have been phenomenal successes. I mean, are you, and I, I don't know enough, and I'm sorry, I don't know enough about where Brown Jordan is, is going, where they've come, with what's going on currently with you. Are you bringing back some classic things and finding them successful again, just as a just as a side question here for you. So we are, we're proud of our legacy. We're proud of our history. And we, we, you know, we're clear on that, but we're also clear on this. We're not going to go back. We're moving forward. We may take things that we've learned from the past and we may take concepts from the past. And, but we don't, we don't look back. We, we appreciate where we came from, but we look forward. And when it comes to, design um we'll take what we've learned but we're 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 pushing we're, we're pushing as hard as we can we're twisting metal we're finding new things we're creating new things they call them harebrained ideas we come up with all these harebrained ideas to push you know that's who we are is to push our category into different spaces into different places so um so you're you know, pushing the envelope yeah, we're not going to bring stuff back from the past. Um, we'll be clear to our past, but we the way the way that the way that the way that the way that things is what's ahead. How do we stay at Brown Jordan? How do we stay ahead of everybody else? How do we set the trend versus follow the trend? And we don't feel you can do that by looking back. We only look forward. Speaking to that, are you seeing your? The clients, customer base, uh, asking for step up the quality, the craftsmanship, even beyond what you've done. Because I hear you saying twisting metals and doing things that that really kind of push the envelope. In a sense, that is what you're doing. You're you're kind of offering more than they expect, if you will. Is that in getting? I'm sure. Yes, I mean that's what, that. Yeah, that's what I mean. The myth is true. We make you know we make the best outdoor furniture on the planet so that all the, all of what people say is true it, it would be, we we do things in the manufacturing process that no one else does so that's an expectation of who we are and we we look we'll go back and look at collections to improve them but we what, what we do is we look to you know how do we get better you know we we are crystal clear that you know we, we need, as I've said before, we need to look forward, not rest on our laurels, and to stay the brand that people expect us to be, is to, you know, be, be taking something that's great and just trying to make it better in every way that we can. Could be product improvement, um, could be the way we figure out how to do the manufacturing, could be who we partner with, could be materials. All of those types of things are, are discussed and looked upon, you know, pretty much on a daily basis. Okay. Chase, you've got a startup going. You've got clients that you work with. Uh, uh, kind of taking that same that comment that Steve that Stephen just made, what's your thought on that? Uh, quality has always been huge um, in what I deliver, and that's why whether it's been the, the invitation only design stuff that I do or um, just product design in general. I mean, it's, that's the number one comment I get on everything I've ever executed is I, I can't believe how this came together. Or I can't believe how many details are in this. Um, that's just been kind of a common theme. And when I started, uh, I had the opportunity to start with Jack Lasheen at Hancock and Moore. And I remember him telling me the first time we went through the factory, we're going to, we build the nicest leather furniture anybody could in the world. And then we simply assign the best value to it. We do. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, that was, it became really a core part of who I am that I'm, I'm not chasing price point at all. We're, we're probably going to be one of the most ex expensive furniture companies when we launch. Uh, we're not ashamed of that. We're not trying to be any different, but it's because, you know, we've got waterfall tables with 
um, eight finger joints on them to make up a top that have to be absolutely perfect. And then when they get delivered, you know, that's all we hear about is I can't believe this edge detail and I can't believe these metal inlays on here that we're all doing by hand because economy of scale thing, you know, comes into play and we don't have the machines to do it here yet. True. Uh, but it's, you know, that's become part of our trademark now and what we're doing. And uh, I just did a sales meeting this morning with a new account and um, it was, you know, something that I take for granted doing it on a regular basis <laughs> and putting it in place um, is quickly brought to my attention, you know, when they see it and they go to the market and this is a store carrying major furniture retailers and they say there's nothing on our floor like this and so it just you know reaffirms my decision to chase that top one percent because rich people never get poor <laughs> well you know that you don't mind if i use that quote because I'll, I'll probably mm -hmm. repeat that a couple of times certainly over a glass of wine somewhere along the way this weekend uh Question for, for all of you and, and whoever wants to start can, this is kind of a general question. Uh, what other design trends and directions, this could be referring to, to, to textures, colors, fabrics, the general um, design look of a piece or a, a direction, uh, do you see making their appearance now, just now or, or in the near future? Do you have a feeling of, of trends that are coming on right now? Uh, more than what we've spoken about already. Um, whoever wants to start can start. I'll say Fred, since no one's speaking up. I mean, I wish I could predict trends. I mean, a couple of things um, we've been doing a lot of thinking about, obviously about work from home. Mm -hmm. um, we're, like I said, we're doing a big project here at SCAD with a group of students and a company re kind of trying to imagine the whole work from home thing. I think work from home, as much as we might go back to the office, it's here to stay. People are going to continue to want a place to work from home. Everybody was sort of taken by surprise and said to just go home and people didn't have the right furniture to do that. And so people are going to be prepared now. Um, so that's the issue. I think outdoor furniture, you know, we design as much outdoor furniture as do indoor furniture. And it's just like, it just boomed. I mean, in the last, you know, 15 years or so, it's just like everybody now is in the outdoor furniture business. I mean, Steve can probably attest, and there used to be like a handful of good companies. And now everybody is making outdoor furniture. And I think people, um, you know, want to use the outdoors as like an extension of their living space. And I think if you live, if you live in Boston, you got three good months. You want to make you know, the best use of those three good months. If you live in Savannah, Georgia, you're may all, all you know, be outside all year long. So I think wherever you are, you're making the best use of that outdoor space. And it's, it's huge. It's a market that seems to be just completely booming. Amy. Um, as far as trends go, you know, they're emerging and evolving. I think that there's still some trends that we felt were prominent in 2020 that, are still moving to 21 and even 22. We were talking about 22 trends and uh, what we're working on right now because we're already working on um, spring 22 products. And to go back to the pandemic and, and things paring down, we are seeing modernism come in in a very strong way, but there's also a softness and femininity to it that I don't think we saw previously, um, whether it's, uh, we call it 20s contemporary, or you can call it the Milano. Um, mm -hmm. And it's got um, softer lines. So it's definitely more in my mind, I find contemporary to have more curves and then modern has um, more right angles, if you will. And I think that we're seeing a little bit more of that come through mm -hmm. right now. I'm going to get back to Fred before we finish, but uh, let me ask Chase that, that question as well. What, what trends are you seeing out there? And what are you hearing from clients, customers? Well, we don't necessarily, as a company, <laughs> follow trends per se, since we are so story-based. I mean, colors and things will somewhat affect it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we'll, we'll kind of influence the way we might necessarily show it, but um, I chased trends for a while, um, especially high fashion trends and translated to furniture and things like that. And um, it just, 
when you have good design, it's good design and it's not good this year and bad next year. So um, we don't chase as much trends as we do. I mean, we may follow like, you know, we need more writing desks right now because people are doing things. But uh, outside of that, I mean, we don't necessarily dictate forms based on what's hot in the market right now or six months from now. Got it. Steve, your name was mentioned in vain, so uh, go ahead and defend yourself. <laughs> so we, we um, well, no, I agree. I actually agree with Amy and Chase. So I totally agree on that seeing the soft, the, the softer curves, our new collections would actually say the same thing. So as it relates to trends, um, we actually, Chase and I actually, I think, agree. So when it comes to the furniture, Good design is good design. We've got collections from the 50s still on the line, so in the 60s and 70s. So good design is good design. Where we, when I talk about trend, I talk about trend as it relates to color, textiles, and material. And that's where, you know, the design is the design, the form is the form. Where we, where we are known, and what Fred talked about, and where we are known is for we will push the envelope as it relates to colors. We'll develop new colors as it relates to especially our category and we'll set trend versus follow trend as it relates to the relationships we have as it relates to textiles, as it relates to color and then maybe material. But we, I agree completely with Amy and Chase on everything that they said. And you know, good design is good design. We are a classic example of it because we've got collections from all those different years that, that still exist. We set trend as it relates to color, texture, and materials. Got it. Fred, I, I did get back to you. The question is, and, uh, since Amy knows well the SCAD students, and, and I know Stephen does as well, uh, are you getting any, <clears throat> any feeling from them about what's, you know, what's going to be coming out of their minds as they graduate and move on into the, into the world of, of design and whatever direction they choose to go in? I mean, are you... Are, are you being surprised by anything they're, they're saying or doing uh, with their projects this year or anything else? Um, I'm always surprised um, <laughs> at what students do. But I think, um, I mean, it, our students sort of fall into several different categories. There's, there's students who, who are really um, just want to get into the market and design <laughs> furniture and, you know, uh, have a design job and be in the furniture industry. Or students who just fall in love with the building component to it and just, you know, we have, as Amy knows, the facilities yeah. that are just, and Steve's been here, like, it's incredible, right? You can't help but be seduced by building furniture. Yeah. And, um, and so I think we, a lot of people sort of migrate to furniture because they discover that. They may not come here to study furniture, but they all of a sudden they walk in here, they take a class in furniture, they're, um, they look at the incredible facilities we have and they just love it, you know? So I think um, I see, you know, they're into building. I mean, they're into kind of like handmade and I think a lot of them want to pursue that. Um, uh, there's a trend right now in sort of, uh, I can't remember the actual term, but sort of oversized, almost sort of childish forms. Well, you see it a lot in the market kind of in a way like has a sense of humor and, and odd scale to it. A lot of our, our students have kind of been affected by that and they're making sort of, you know, pieces that, that are, you know, uh, overly scaled and overly proportioned in, in sort of strange ways. And, um, and some of that's really interesting. It's kind of really on trend now, softer forms, most of our students are like into kind of, we have this incredible five bath milling machine that can carve some of the most beautiful things that, you know, when I was a student, we would all have to do by hand and very, you know, lots of making these very carved, very soft, very organic forms would seem to be pretty popular now, but like, you know, just some, we, just some just amazing stuff comes out of here and students, uh, we, we have our seniors are all having their final show in a week. And so it's coming down the wire and some really amazing, amazing things. Well, thank you. Thank you, Fred. That, that brings us kind of to the close of our time. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to say one trend that seems to everybody has mentioned is comfort and comforting coming out of out of COVID, uh, yeah, like a, a warm fuzzy, pulling out a big sheet of towel sheet out of your dryer and wrapping yourself in it uh, as you walk outdoors to look at your flowers, which you spent all year looking at last year. Uh, so it's, 
it's a, a pleasure to talk to each of you. Amy, thank you for your time. Thank you so Ray. much. Stephen, wonderful. Chase, thank you. awesome down there in Texas. Keep it going. Uh, send me a pair of those shoes. I thought I'll take the ones on the left, or Amy will probably take that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but thank you all for your participation. I, we appreciate it. Uh, International Market Centers appreciates it. Uh, hope some of you are coming to market. Uh, June is going to be exciting. October is going to be fun. That's what I hear anyway. Yeah. So thank you again for all your, your time and your talents and your uh, input today. Thank, thank you. you.